Paul, did you ever have doubts about or disrobing? Never wanted to disrobe. <laughs> 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 I, I I tried to contemplate this roaming you know, as a possibility, but I never. Not because I was wanted to disrobe, you know. Was there something better to do than this? And so I tried to imagine all kind of possibilities of, uh, you know, suddenly I inherit a billion dollars or. Being a wealthy heiress, and <laughs> or to become, uh, you know, famous, or become have everything, you know, all, all things, you know, all the best, you know, ideas of, of you know, just fantasies. But even even that, I I really appreciate this life, you know. I think this, to me this is the best you can get you know, as a human being <laughs> and uh, because it, you know you're, you're like like here you can live in a society and you're you're uh, you know, you're not rejecting society and you're dependent on it you need the society to support the support of it but you're not contributing to its Foolishness, or its corruption, or its its dark side, and that that's a real you know that's the best you can do in in this human realm. Like like living in in England, you know, it's, I felt I was living you know I wasn't you know I wasn't contributing I wasn't reinforcing all the 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 dark side of that society. Uh, I didn't even, but I was there, and then then you, your monasteries open, people can come and hear dhamma and practice things like this. So you're 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 actually giving opportunities for people to benefit, mm -hmm. and all you're asking, you know, is necessary is like uh, one meal a day, shelter for the, uh, the, 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 you know, we're not asking for, you know, big salaries. And, and I remember teachers years ago when we first moved there. A woman, English woman, was a nurse, came to see me, and she was very aggressive. And she said, "Do you expect to just sit here and and we come and feed you? And uh, you know, what do you do for the society? You know?" And she was going on like that, really rude. And and so I said, "Well, you know, if I was an Anglican vicar, Christian priest." I, for what I do, I could demand, you know, like thirty thousand pounds a year. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not asking for anything. So all you have to do is just drop a, you know, you don't even have to do that. Drop a lump of rice in the bowl. <laughs> Carrot? <laughs> well, Paul, I, I wanted to ask kind of in, in relation to that relationship between monks and society, I was wondering what you thought of in a more socially engaged Buddhism or socially engaged monks, monks who can be involved with you know, environmentalist actions or <clears throat> like human rights or other kind of more politically or socially mm, activist movements. What do you thought of, of monks who, who do that? I mean, those are very good, you know, they're usually involved in good causes. But to me, you know, I, I, in England I had to figure out what, because I became such a popular figure there in the beginning that I became president of the Buddhist society and, you know, and there's people inviting me all over the place and, and giving meditation retreats and, and, and I kind of just spread myself out where 
I was hardly at the monastery. And um, then I began to see that, you know, I just think, you know, what what can I do that lay, lay Buddhists couldn't do? You know, what is my particular, how can I benefit this society? Let's say a, a lay teacher, a lay meditation teacher couldn't do. And I can establish a monastery. You know, and, and I can, I became Upachaya. And I, I could ordain monks and I could set up monastic discipline and vinaya and, and, and training programs and and that for people interested in that. And lay people can't do that. So then I, I began to see that and then there was a lot of this engaged thing going on, especially in the eighties and when the uh, nuclear threats, you know, the the and Britain was very much uh, there's a lot of paranoia there because the Americans were arming Britain with cruise missiles and there was a lot of protests, anti-war movements and all kinds of good causes, you know, that one felt sympathetic with. But uh, I, I decided just to, rather than get caught out in all these other things, I'd have to concentrate just on what I'm, what I know how to do. You know. <clears throat> There were plenty of other people doing the other things, so I, I, I started uh, stepping back from all these other engagements and just, uh, you know, just because I could, you know, realize I was just out of good intentions, just being doing too much and burning out. And then, then I could see, you know, thinking, well, these are good causes, I should support it. And because of the kind of grand gestures that I have, you know, wanting to help and support worthy things. But then this is where your, your reflective mind, you know, helps you to kind of observe what, you know, just one physical being, you only have so much energy. And, you know, you, and what? What is it that, that I can do is train, teach uh, monks, and uh, and I established this nuns order. I was trying to very interested in trying to provide uh, good facilities for women, and so I, I you know I did a lot of things to try to bring the dharma to people. But uh, at the end of the day. I realized I became a more kind of what my pole. <laughs> you know, just like the, this. This was enough. This is what I could offer, and 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 I, you know, because it, all my experiments with other things were were not going very well. So I became very conservative monk in England. <laughs> but, you know, like Ajahn Paisan, and, and the, he's very active in the in game here. He, you know, I know him, and he's, I respect what he's doing. And he knows how to practice. You know, there's not, I have no judgment against it. I'm not, I have no opinion about it really, but I, I don't particularly. I mean, I like I like that of not being in taking sides on politics and social issues, uh, political issues, because like like our position in the society is one of a, a moral pointing, you know, encouraging sila, uh, donna sila, rather than taking sides on political groups and you know on a personal level you 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 sympathize with one and don't win. and so you know emotionally you you have your preferences but you know your role in the society is what is is not a political one not taking sides but giving opportunity for both sides to listen to dhamma and to 
take the seal and things like that. And so that's what so much is missing in, like, say, in the in other countries. They don't have that that level, that kind of center point to refer to. You know, it's usually you take sides on political issues and human rights issues and moral issues and and uh, ideals and and then you 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 tend to argue and um, these things and that but but you know the Buddha established uh, this middle way in order to to allow to to encourage the the respect for Dana Sila from whoever is interested you know from whatever level or left or right side of the political spectrum whether they're beggars or kings or whatever <coughs> and in Thailand they don't in, in Sri Lanka isn't it they monks are members of parliament things like that they have strong political views but I've noticed in Thailand when a monk gets into that it gets very you know doesn't last very long <laughs> <laughs> the political assassinations of monks in Sri Lanka to Kathmandu. Really? Yeah. These these active ones, the political. Uh yes, yeah. Protests and assassinations. Yeah. Comes with the job. <laughs> <laughs> and then the ones in Burma that are right. that are anti-Muslim. That's, you know, that's morally not right. Telling people to kill Muslims. But that's a moral issue, not a political one. And then here in Thailand, you hear people saying, "Well, the, the religion is, you know, you, they, like now in the news, you know, the newspapers, Thai newspapers, they, they always, you know, headlines about some monk that's corrupt and scandals and that. So it it it, it gives this impression that uh, you know that the religion is is corrupted." And Lumpa Chami at very clear said, no, no, Buddhism can't be corrupted. People corrupt. People get corrupted, but not Dhamma. <laughs> 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 and it's true, you know, when you look at the Buddhist teaching, you know, like in the suttas, I mean, they're the same. They, they, they're not, they've never been corrupted for 2,556 years. You know, there's all kinds of changes that have taken place, you know, in Buddhist countries and, <clears throat> and uh, you know, empires and kingdoms and flourish. Sometimes Buddhism flourishes and then it's persecuted and disappears, but actually the, the essential teaching has never been corrupted. But individual monks can be corrupted, but not, not, not the... Uh, the, the teaching. Such as the shattering the theory of a conspiracy of, of, of a old monks against a woman who changed the Dhamma. And yeah, because it's a, you know, like, like the, the Western mentality is one of believing in progress as a reality, you know, so like the American mind tends to think that we're here to make everything advance and progress and better than what it is. And so this is, uh, you know, and then it's easy for, you know, in the States to, to assume that, well, Buddhism is an old religion appropriate for ancient India or maybe for Asian countries. But when it comes to America, we've got to Americanize it and make it 
progressive and, and so it fits into the social values and the culture of Americans make it an American type of Buddhism <laughs> <laughs> or in Britain you know the British Buddhism is uh, you know we're not that Thai stuff or that, but we're going to really you know make it ours and uh, I've heard that you know and there's some movements in, in Britain you know that are that are doing that, you know, new forms in British Buddhism and American Buddhism and things like that. But then, but you know, like I trained here in Thailand in tradition, and and the tradition is and a tradition is something that that comes from the we you know we, we assume that it comes from the Buddha. Uh, 2,500 years ago in India and so it's, it's set up like you said at the Dhamma of India <clears throat> and the Sangha so and that traditional form that's managed to survive and when you, when you look at it it's, a, it's really you know quite miraculous to, to think that that you actually have an ancient tradition from ancient India still working well within uh, like Britain or America you know where it's never really you know, before this there was not much knowledge or understanding or interest in Buddhism in the Christian Western world so and now there is and then the establishing these monasteries like in England and so forth they're, they're they work you know they don't have to really do a lot to to make them uh, work within the, the the social values and structure of modern life but the mentality of the West is is still this belief that somehow we're advanced and and, and we've got to make these old things up to date up, and that's a conceit that we have you know, I can see it myself. It's not complete that, that we've got to make it more agreeable, more Western, more American than than it is. But but I think the value, like in in England, of of keeping to a traditional form is that it's not going to become popular, you know, mass masses of people, but it, it, it's going to be available to people interested, you know, in, in this kind of life, living within a structural, an ancient tradition and practicing meditation. So you, you, you don't need, I don't, I don't want to change it. So you have to adapt to contingencies like weather and that. So you you can't survive very long like this. <laughs> but you you know that's fair enough. But in uh, generally speaking, it works very well. I never I never really had uh, difficulties from the society there. And so that's why I trust it, because, you know, I put it to the test. You know, I didn't know what was going to happen when I went to live in, in England. If, you know, whether there would be any interest, or I'd starve to death, or people would throw rocks at me, or what, put me in a mental institution. I, mean, I, was, I was open to anything. <laughs> but, but it's a nice country, you know, and it has. You know, it has this sense of fairness, and and it wants to do the right thing, and so you, and it's very tolerant towards religion. And you read about English history. You know, they've got their, you know, persecuting. And it's places in London that they have marked where people were uh, beheaded or killed. You know, drawn and quartered for public observation, you know, of hang, uh, public hangings, and if you were a heretic or a Catholic, you know, when, when it became Protestant, then they'd, they'd hang Catholics 
and this was only a few hundred years ago and uh, now uh, can't do that you can't hang Catholics or <laughs> Buddhists <laughs> In fact, they're incredibly tolerant towards it all. Well, that's that's progress, you know. <laughs> but if if we were just about Indian culture, then you could see it. It wouldn't. But it's about truth, you know, suffering, about dukkha and its causes and how to deal with it, you know. So it it applies to the you know to anyone whether. You know, it's not about, you know, a, a cultural, uh, specific to a culture. It's about a universal reality that we share. Because suffering is, everybody can relate to that. Because, it, you know, that's what we experience. Whether, you know, it's Europe, Asia, wherever. And then in, in a country like affluent Western Europe or America, you've got, you have a high standard of living and, and good governments and uh, good economies and things like this, but still people suffer. So, I mean, it, it's, you can't blame your suffering on the poverty or tyrannical governments and things like this, but it's even, you know, the wealthy people suffer terribly. And here in Thailand, you know, <coughs> I meet a lot of very wealthy people and uh, they've got all kinds of suffering problems. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, they've got the money to get anything they want and travel and things. Uh, Thailand's a nice country to live in, but you can still create misery in your mind about it. And that, that's where the, the reflective kind of ability, where you, you know, because the suffering is common to us all, whether it's the king of Thailand or beggar or, you know, male or female or, you know, whatever race or nationality, class, there's this dukkha, is, there's this dukkha. And it should be understood. You know, see, so you know, so being wealthy is not the solution. You know, sometimes you have more dukkha because you you're so attached to it, and and you you know, if you don't have much money, and you become a a monk, you know, it's easier than if you have a lot of money and you have to give it up. <laughs> <laughs> Your standard of living can actually improve, Lumpa, coming to ordain here. Well, that was uh, what I discovered at one point was, because I'm from, you know, like a middle class family, you know, and in America, so you 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 have you're born into this level of, you know. Of, a certain, and it would be considered luxurious for for us, you know, for in, in, for monks. But you, you just take it for granted because that's what you know and what you assume is normal. And uh, like my parents were always very careful about you know the food we had and three meals a day and we had a nice house and. And everything was, you know, this is what you expected to get in life. And then, then when I went to Wat Pa Pong, you know, it was sleeping on a mat on the bare floor and and one meal a day, and and there was no electricity, no refrigeration, nothing. Just basic, uh, very primitive conditions. But, you know, I realized 
how little I needed. You know, I didn't need all that electricity and 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 the things that I, you know, felt I needed to survive. And it was a relief to know that you how little you really need. And but the mind, you see, is the thing that if you develop the mind, the, the the mind, then it doesn't matter so much about the external things. Whether if you're rich or poor is not really important anymore. Okay. What do you think um, the sort of the future or the situation with with Buddhism in the West? Like, um, I've only really seen it in Australia, where most of the lay people who are coming to the temple. They weren't really interested in, you know, past future lives or, you know, getting out of samsara. They were more interested in just like meditating to get happiness, like right now in this life. And, and now, you know, any any time the teacher sort of talked about, like, you know, um, to the deep into this, or the suffering of samsara, or you know, even born of the truth, people seem to have a bit of aversion to even hearing that. It always seems to be like just for feeling happy. But I don't know. I always thought that was a bit of a like. You know, the shell of what is not gone, but the essence isn't yet actually opinion. Okay. You know, people are, you know, for different reasons. And that's kind of, you know, want a peaceful mind or uh, you know, calm down. His life is very stressful now for most people, and so you, you know you get a lot of stress problems. People, you know, just so busy and and, and constantly caught into the rat race, and and, the, and it's you know things move faster now than before, you know, with with all the modern technology. And, and what and there is well there's a lot more tension. And then there's the social problems of, you know, the economy, everybody you know, we're it's very materialistic, you know, like we're looked at as consumers now. They talk about it as consumers, like we're no longer citizens. We just you know, like big mouths consuming. <laughs> it's a not an insulting way to talk about it. <laughs> to me, it's not like insulting. Like, see, you know, when you think of a citizen, you think of a human being in a, a more kind of honorable way of of addressing him in the human individuals and uh, consumer. See, if I see this consumer, it changes my relationship to <laughs> the revenue. <laughs> yeah, how you know, much you know? You got to pay your taxes. <laughs> and so, it, and it is very, you know. That's why religion now is, is like in uh, Britain is not it's not persecuted because it's not important anymore. Your spiritual life is just not an issue. It's about you know your your rights and. Uh, Paying taxes and financing the government, making the economy work, and and for modern economies, you've got to make people desire things. You've got to create desire in their minds. So, so you know, everything the advertisements and everything is designed to make you want never to be content with what you have, but they're always offering a a newer and better. Thing that and they, and they and they condition you to want the new, the best, and the newest, and the improved. And it's ongoing, isn't it? You know, just just uh, you know, because you can, you know, that's what they stimulate the economy with is desire, keeping people greedy and discontented with what they have. So you. are that's what modern, you know, free market capitalism does. It just makes you discontented. 
and envious. You know, you you know, you kind of make people think, well, the neighbors they got the latest model and it looks better than mine is last year. It's, it creates envy. You know, you you want to keep up with the Joneses. And <laughs> That's a, that's the world we that's the society we're living in, based on stimulating desire. And and this life is about contentment with little. You know, so it's really a contrast to, especially to modern uh, modern societies, where they they don't want you to be content with last year's fashion. So you know they they. they deliberately create a new fashion which they promote as better than last year's. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, it's all these advertisements and they, they, you know, it's a psychology too. They, 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 they get psychologists to figure out how you can make people want things they don't really need. How you can keep stirring up their minds making them greedy. So, I mean, this is the society we're living in, you know, and it's just to recognize that that's, that's, the, that's the social milieu that we're, we're living in. And it's not based on religious belief anymore. You can believe anything you want. No. You can believe in disbelief, you can say. You'd be an atheist. And it's perfectly, it's very respectable to be an atheist in Britain, you know, and then you can deny God and uh, things like this. And so you, you know, you can curse God, you can curse God, you can make fun of the Queen. <laughs> and, and Prince Charles, you know, poor guy, he's they love to criticize him and make fun of him and everything he does, you know. He, he, you know, he's always, you know, uh, the paparazzi are always trying to get, get him in embarrassing poses or something to make fun of him. Just, you can't do that in Thailand. <laughs> it's against the law. But in England, it's fair game. So I kind of, you know, I used to think some of the things they used to say about Prince Charles, he, he should come claim to some human rights organization. Because <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, he's, he's a nice person, you know, he's not somebody to despise, but he is, you know, high up in the, in the, you know, in the royal family, but be the future king, but still, uh, you know, the society is a profane one. It's not about respect or or that kind of, you know, respecting elders, or it's not about, uh, you know, being glad, or mudita as a, as a sense of being uh, glad at someone's success or position. It's about, let's, you know, he thinks he's better than me. Let's, let's, let's knock him down, you know, he's up on the pedestal. Let's, let's destroy the pedestal, watch him fall on his butt. <laughs> 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 you know, these are, it's fair game now. And so, you know, the, that's where, where this tradition is, it, it helps us to get into some kind of relationship to structure and hierarchy. And uh, because, you know, like uh, the American mind, we're, we're brought up to think hierarchy is wrong. And patriarchy is is something evil, you know. Like the feminists in England use the word patriarchy as if it's vile, like satanic, you know. And uh, in fact, some of our nuns were using it one time, and, and so I gave a talk. I said, "Look, you know, patriarchy. It can be good. It can be bad." <laughs> It's not in itself, it's just, you know, a word. And you can have a patriarch that's good, uh, or you have one that isn't. So it's just, you know, this, this kind of way we use language to create 
prejudices against groups or or uh, be abused, you know, find fault with others is rampant. You know, always trying to find ways of criticizing the, the especially the people that are uh, are you know in in, in prominent positions. And that creates, you know, this sense of, uh, you know, the idea that we're all the same, all equal, uh, is an ideal. But actually, you know, Sankara, the level of Sankara is always about difference, not about sameness. You know, so if you're all, you know, I mean, Sankaras are changing and they're not equal. Like, is big equal to small? Something like this. Or, the only thing they have in common is that they're in permanent condition. <laughs> and uh, small is impermanent, big is impermanent. And this is what, what the Buddha is emphasizing, that the, the, the condition phenomena is like this, it's changing. And, and that means that there's no permanent goodness or badness or evil or whatever it's a, it's a, these are concepts we have to describe a, something in the you know that we you know maybe it can be evil in the present moment but it's not permanent it, it, evil changes it's like good goodness and so this is this is where the wisdom the panya faculty starts informing us how to live this life so the structure is saying monastic is based on a seniority um, you know, who ordains first, not on personal preferences or social position or, you know, you know, even a, like an arahant, uh, it still bows to the senior monk, even though the senior monk may not be one, because that's a structure. <coughs> And that that makes it, our life workable. Otherwise, <coughs> it's, it's uh, you know each one to his own. And then you can How could we live together if we just you know each we made up our own rules and did what we wanted? We, we couldn't live together. And this this is what why I think you know that like the tradition this traditional form has a point to it because in in England for example there's so many meditation groups and and uh, and psychotherapy groups and there's always this self-awareness and and uh, exploring yourself and improving yourself and and uh, and then there's all attempts to take, Buddhism and make it modern and and kind of psychotherapeutic and 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 you know and not discuss not use the Buddhist words anymore. You present you know Buddhist meditation, but without the Pali words, without Buddha Dhamma Sang or anything. Uh, so so this is so you can present because it's based on a universal reality. You can you you know you can present. Dhamma in in any form as science as psychology as uh, philosophy it fits into every category and but it also fits into the religious one the religion and and then this like what we have is a religious form <coughs> and uh, and that means that it you you we have the right to use these words use Pali, use Buddhist terms, establish a uh, Vinaya, and that because of we, we've committed ourselves to this traditional form. And uh, and then it and then it offers like it's a it's a like a like a very sharp tool. You know, if you use it rightly it's, it's like it, you don't you know if you if you just changed it around it would lose its sharpness you know become uh, you know in the end probably become quite useless 
But if you if you keep to the you know if you learn how to use it in the right way, it's a very it cuts through the delusion right away. And and that's what I felt in in, in England, where there's a lot of pressure on me to change things there, uh, because people wanted you know didn't didn't like the structure of seniority or the relationship of men, of nuns to monks and. And there was always these kind of issues going on in a society where you, you know, people are very much concerned with human rights and fairness and ideals and democracy and freedom and and respect for individuals and so forth. So it, you're dealing, you know, you have to deal with this high level of idealism, uh, which has you know, you know, it's not, it's to be respected because it's, but it is ideal. It's based on ideal thinking, but I mean, it's not an understanding of how things are. You see, and that's what we lack. Why why our societies are just caught up in materialism because we we don't know how things are. We we know how they should be. All of us could, you know, could create a perfect society in our minds <laughs> you know everything's fair everything's equal everybody's free uh, you know there's no rich or poor uh, you can create this, this you know like the communists tried to do this ideal uh, political economic system but it, you know it, it's an ideal it doesn't when you you know, like in the Soviet Union, when they tried to to make it into communism, they used uh, tyranny to do it. So they, you know, you force, you know, you've got to believe this, and you, you know, if I have very good ideas, and I force them on you, you don't hear the, the brilliant ideas I'm forcing on you, you just feel my bullying, tyranny. <laughs> you know, so you, you can't, <laughs> you can't even understand what I'm saying because you're just feeling this, this, uh, this, thing, this anger and, and, and uh, uh, you know, force compelling you to, uh, without respect or understanding you in any way, just forcing my views down your throat. You know, like one of these geese, you know, where they stuff food down his throat to get this pate. <laughs> 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 and of course, you know, like in in, uh, in basic, like in Thailand, the tum di di di, tum chua di chua, it's so basic, like every school children, school child knows that. Do good, you receive good, do bad, you receive bad of karma and and to get the proper end you have to have the proper means so the end doesn't justify the means in Buddhist terms to wage war to have a peace is an impossibility you know war for peace <laughs> kill kill the forces axis of evil and kill the devil and uh, annihilate the enemy uh, Get rid of Saddam Hussein or whoever, and uh, but how are things really now? What are, you know? What is the nature of our life? You know, and and there's suffering common to all of us, and 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 there's causes, and there's, and if you awaken to the suffering, then you see it, its presence and absence, and then you're developing, you begin to understand the way things are rather than be grasping high-minded ideas about how things should be. This we lack. You know, we don't we don't have this as a part of our training, education, culture. It's all about how things should be. And how we want them to be. And rather than and then we're always discontented with ourselves or with life because we can never live up to these ideals.
you know, you just, personally, you can't do it. Because we're not ideals. We have to live with bodies like this. You know, they, they feel everything. And they, we've got blood running through our veins, and we've got nerve endings, and, you know, sensory activity, you know, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, you know. I only want to look at what is really beautiful, you know. And, uh, and so you, you, you're a wealthy person, so you build a special, beautiful play house in a beautiful place uh, with works of art and everything is beautiful. And you have marry a very beautiful woman and you have beautiful children. <laughs> But inevitably, it's going to change. You know, how can you sustain that that level of visual beauty? You know, your wife's going to get old and no longer beautiful. <laughs> your children might be beautiful when they're young, but they can be real bastards when they're older. <laughs> and, I mean, <laughs> and then you might be living in a beautiful place and suddenly an earthquake comes or a revolution takes place. I mean, because this is the way things are. You, and all our attempts to build utopian situations, uh, you know, end up in, in disillusionment. And so is peace really what people want? Or they just want they, they like the ideal of peace, or the ideal of democracy, or that, I mean, these are beautiful ideals, but the reality is we have to learn how to relate to the unpeacefulness of the samsara, of the conditions changing. But instead of just trying to deny it or change it, where a relationship is observing, because then we're we're behind it all. We, we're actually witnessing uh, it with wisdom rather than just trying to get rid of the sankaras. And you'll never succeed at that. You know, you know, you've got a human body, you've got a, it gets cold, gets hot, tired, gets old, <laughs> sick. You've got to feed it. You've got to, you know, it's got different functions, anything but peaceful, and, you know, it's learning how to live with it is not through, you know, it's not suicide, it's against the Binaya. So... Uh, Something needs to fail, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, uh, you don't get punished. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's not the pro it's not about the body anymore, about the, the conditions and all that, but it's and knowing it for what it is. It is. This is what's possible for us as human beings to be able to do this. <laughs> and that's what's so so wonderful about it is that it, you know, my personal personality is, it, you know, is, is is one that always tends to be a bit on the negative side, saying, you know, you can't do it, or, uh, you know, seeing things in terms of, of some kind of value judgment. But then the experience of training in this tradition is that, it actually works, you know, and you can. It's not asking the impossible from any of us. And it's based on something ordinary rather than on some special skill that, that someone might have that you, you don't have. Like, you know, some kind of ability to concentrate the mind and live in the Deva realm or something, but this is about suffering in this realm, because this realm the human form is a is a suffering vehicle. It's all about change, old age, sickness, death, loss. You have to experience grief, you know, loss of loved ones, seeing our parents get old and die and, and disappointment 
because life isn't going to be all that accommodating to our desires for happiness. We, you know, so this realm is is a realm of dukkha, but not in a negative way. It's not like a put down. It's a it's a it's a understanding of it, and that's where the brilliance of the Buddha was pointing to that something extremely simple, obvious in your face, you know, but oftentimes never really admitted or understood because we we can always run from it, look for happiness. Well, it's a, what's your opinion, like, on, you know, samsara being within the mind of the individual or also externally? Or like, you know, you know, the Buddha attained, you know, Buddhahood and Arnold's pre-mannership. It's like he's saying, in a sense, it's still here, but that sort of it was not free from the suffering of samsara. I mean, that the mind is sort of pure and it's not actually in a state of suffering. Like that. Which is that pointing at samsara. Well, this is, is like, you can't, you know, right now you're experiencing the world uh, from where you are. So I'm actually in your mind at this point. <laughs> <laughs> And I come and go, don't I? You know, so that uh, you know you're with your mind all 24 hours of the day and night, and uh, and and then that you know then we create the world, and that's like the 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 ego sakya ditti sila bhakta barmasamitikide. We're creating a whole universe, realm, a conditioned attitude and and we create this out of avicca, ignorance of Dhamma. We don't we don't know Dhamma, so we we live in, in the world of our own creation. We think we share the same world. You know, we assume that the world that we're living in is the same for all of us. But not really. Because right at this moment I'm in your world <laughs> and, and the same thing you're in my world at this moment and uh, and so is Thailand so is Ireland <laughs> and so and the sun and moon and stars you know because this is this is what you can know you're, you're observing what you can actually know in a direct way not from <clears throat> God's position of knowing from the top, knowing everything about everything. And this is where you have to trust this knowing within the, you know, you you, you might conceive yourself as a speck in the universe, uh, you know, just a nobody, and uh, you know, if you, you know, if you drop dead right now, who, you know, a few people might know about it, but the rest of the world, you know, just wouldn't know. And uh, wouldn't care. <laughs> so, but you do. You know, you the world you're living in right now is your creation and what you're used to, and it's important to you. And so this is like, and then your 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 changing relationship to the world, to observing it rather than creating it, and that's what mindfulness. Is sati sampatanya, and it is 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 letting go of the world to observe it, and and we all do this. We all create our own world. We all live in our own world, even though we we assume that we're sharing the same world. And and Ajahn Chah used to like to shock Western visitors when they come to Wat Pa Po. I'd be translating for him, and uh, he'd say something like. Uh, did you come here to see the end of the world? And they, what's he talking about? And I'd translate that literally in English. See, man, you know, what do you mean by that? End of the world. 
I came here to learn meditation and <laughs> make the world better. <laughs> and then, then he'd say, the world ends here. And point to his heart, you know, the world ends here. And and well, that you know, for myself, I could I could contemplate that, you know what, you know, there's a kind of, un, you know, the literal understanding. The end of the world means you know the Armageddon or whatever. But in terms of you know on a big scale, but in terms of it's happening all the time in the mind, the rising, ceasing, uh, sukha, dukkha, and all the rest is going on, you know, and we. We create, you know, our, we're conditioned to think and create images and hold to ideals, and that's the world that we live in. And and then the now in, in the monastic life, you you can create a world around monasticism and so forth. But the point is not to 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 create, but to understand. <coughs> and then then it goes back to this simple. Really, all conditions are impermanent, and and then you, so that means everything. For your every thought, every desire, refined course, true false, you know, good bad, right or wrong, course, refined, distant sun, moon, stars, but the the world that we actually live and feel it is the one we create and then we have our own views about the sun and moon and the stars <laughs> as well as you know this person that person or whatever they're conditioned you know that through cultural conditioning to to approve of this disapprove of that and then the, the mindfulness gives us perspective on both liking, disliking, as we experience it. You know, not as, as some theory, but as just mean observing of it. And that which observes is 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 uh, pure conscious awareness. It's, it's universal. It's unitive. It's not not personal anymore. What what unites every all creation, all these different animals and things in this vast, complex, complicated world of nature and people and stars and so forth? Is consciousness embraces all of it, you know? So it's, <coughs> it's uh, and this is what we can actually recognize through discerning it. You know, and we're not separate from it. It's just not noticed, not recognized. So that's the point of the power now, and the meditation is to be able to recognize this reality, the re ultimate reality, <coughs> within the limitations of the world you create. You know, and your own personal uh, loves and hates and feelings and physical, mental conditions. 